Chapter 7 Pressure from Above and Pressure from Below The establishment's official landscape artists have done a marvelous job of painting a picture of Richard Nixon as a conservative. Unfortunately, this picture is 20 years out of date. The very liberal senator, Hugh Scott of Pennsylvania, boasted to a reporter one day, Liberals get the action and the conservatives get the rhetoric. Richard Nixon could not have been elected had he run as a Rockefeller liberal, but he can get away with running his administration like one simply because the landscape painters failed to call the public's attention to the fact. However, columnist Stuart Alsop, in writing for a sophisticated audience of approving liberals, reveals the real Nixon. Alsop claims that if Nixon were judged by his deeds instead of his ancient image, the liberals' attitude toward him would be different. If only the liberals' Pavlovian response to the Nixon name could be eliminated, says Alsop, they would realize how far left he is. Therefore, Alsop substitutes a hypothetical President Liberal for President Nixon. If President Liberal were actually in the White House, it is not at all hard to imagine the reaction to his program. The right would be a sailing President liberal, liberal for bugging out of Vietnam, undermining American defenses, fiscal irresponsibility, and galloping socialism. The four basic presidential policy positions listed above would be greeted with hosannas by the liberals. Instead, the liberals have showered the president with dead cats, while most conservatives have maintained a glum silence, and thus the administration has been little credited for much a genuine achievement. But there are certain special reasons which Pat Moynihan omitted to mention. Why this is so? Alsop further explains how having the reputation of being an enemy of the liberal Democrats helps Nixon pass their program. For one thing, there is a sort of unconscious conspiracy between the president and his natural enemies, the liberal Democrats, to conceal the extent to which his basic program, leaving aside frills and rhetoric, is really, really the liberal Democratic program. Richard Nixon is the first professional politician and real Republican to be elected president in 40 years. It is not in the self-interest of the liberals to give credit to such a president for liberal initiatives. By the same token, it is not in the self-interest of the president to risk his conservative constituency by encouraging the notion that he is not a real Republican, after all, but a lo liberal Democrat at cut rates. There are plenty of examples of the mutual obfuscation which results from this mutual interest. The withdrawal of half a million men from Vietnam is quite obviously the greatest retreat in American history, but the president talks as though it was were somehow a glorious advance, certain to guarantee a just and lasting peace. When the president, like any commander of a retreat, resorts to spoiling actions to protect his dwindling rear guard, the liberals howl that he is chasing the will o the wisp of military victory. When the president cuts back real military st strength more sharply than in a quarter of a century, the liberals attack him for failing to reorder priorities. The president, in his rhetoric about a strong defense, plays the same game. The result, as John Kenneth Galbraith accurately noted recently, is that most people, and maybe most congressmen, think the administration is indulging the Pentagon even more than the Democrats, which is the precise opposite of the truth. Alsop continued what is probably the most damning column ever written about Richard Nixon by noting the role with the mass media have played in portraying to the public an image that is the reverse of the truth. There is also a human element in this exercise and mutual obfuscation to the liberals, especially the liberal commentators who dominate the media. Richard Nixon is Dr. Fell. The reason why I cannot tell, but this I know, and know full well, I do not like the Dr. Fell. This is not surprising. Not too many years ago, Richard M. Nixon was one of the most effective and least lovable of the conservative Republican professionals of the McCarthy era. The columnist himself, a member of the Socialist Americans for Democratic Action, ADA, speculated on what the old Nixon would have to say about the new Nixon. On his past record, it is not at all hard to imagine R.M. Nixon leading the assault on the president for his bug out, fiscal irresponsibility, galloping socialism, and all the rest of it. So how can one expect Mr. Nixon to defend President Liberal's program with the passionate conviction that a President Robert Kennedy, say, would have brought to the defense of such a program? Alsop has revealed the real Nixon and is obviously pleased. 
Those who voted for Nixon shouldn't be quite so happy. If you like the Richard Nixon who ran for the presidency, then you cannot. If you are consistent like the Richard Nixon who is president, Nixon and his fellow moderates have turned the Republican elephant into a donkey in elephant's clothing. On June 19, 1959, Vice President Nixon gloated, In summary, the Republican administration produced the things that the Democrats promised. It looks as if it's happening again. A year and a half earlier, Nixon had been warbling a different tune. We have nothing to offer other than a pale carbon copy of the New Deal. If our only purpose is to gain and retain power, the Republican Party no longer has any reason to exist and it ought to go out of business. The Nixon game plan, as Harvard professor John Kenneth Galbraith gleefully points out, is socialism. The Nixon game plan is infinitely more clever and dangerous than those of his predecessors because it masquerades as being the opposite of what it is. Mr. Nixon is aware that most Americans fear big government. An August 1968 Gallup poll showed that 46% of the American public believed that big government was the biggest threat to the country. Gallup commented, Although big government has been a favorite Republican target for many years, rank-and-file Democrats are nearly as critical of growing federal power as our Republicans. Recognizing this attitude, Mr. Nixon geared much of his campaign rhetoric to attack Big Daddy government. However, the Nixon administration has taken massive steps to further concentrate authority in the federal power pinnacle. While centralizing power at a rate which would have made Hubert Humphrey blush, Mr. Nixon has continued to pay lip service to decentralization. During the first year of his administration, Mr. Nixon announced his new federalism, name taken from the title of a book by Nelson Rockefeller. The first part of the new federalism is the Family Assistance Program, FAP, which would, contrary to his campaign promises, provide a guaranteed annual income based on suggestions from John Gardner of the CFR and Daniel Moynihan, a member of the board of directors of the Socialist ADA. The FAP would double the number on welfare and increase tremendously the power of the executive branch of the federal government. The left wing weekly, the New Republic, shared the proposal as creeping socialism. The second major segment of the president's new federalism is revenue sharing with the states, touted as a step high the, the de decentralization of power from the federal government. Actually, the program does just the opposite. The money must first go from the states to Washington before it can be shared. As columnist James J. Kilpatrick remarked, powder control follows the federal dollar as surely as the famous lamb accompanied Little Mary. As soon as the states and local governments get hooked on the federal funds, the controls will be put on just as they were in education and agriculture. Every field the government attempts to take over, it first subsidizes. You can't decentralize the government by centralizing the tax collections. Mr. Nixon's power to the people slogan really means power to the president. House Ways and Means Chairman Wilbur Mills has called the revenue sharing plan a trap that could become a massive weapon against the independence of state and local government. The plan, said Mills, goes in the direction of centralized government. But Mr. Nixon is very clever. In his 1971 State of the Union message, the talk in which he used the communist slogan, Power to the People, the president said, We in Washington will at last be able to provide government that is truly for the people. I realize that what I am asking is that not only the executive branch in Washington, but that even this Congress will have to change by giving up some of its power. That sounds reasonable, doesn't it? The executive branch will give up some power, and the Congress will give up some power, and the people will gain by having these powers returned to them, right? Wrong. That is, what, that is nothing but verbal sleight of hand. Notice the precision of Mr. Nixon's language. He speaks of the executive branch in Washington giving up some of its power. Three days later, it became obvious why. Mr. Nixon added the seemingly redundant in Washington when it was announced that the country was being carved up into ten federal districts. These federal districts would soon be used to administer the wage and price controls, which centralize in the federal government almost total power over the economy. Too many political observers, to, to many political observers, the most shocking development of the past year was the admission by President Richard Nixon to newsman Howard K. Smith that he is now a, a Keynesian in economics. The jolted Smith commented later, That's a little like a 
Christian Crusader saying, all things considered, I think Muhammad is right. Howard K. Smith was well aware that such a statement was tantamount to a declaration by Mr. Nixon that I am now a socialist. John Maynard Keynes, Keynes the English economist and Fabian socialist, bragged that he was promoting the euthanasia of capitalism. It is generally believed in England among students of this conspiracy that John Maynard Keynes produced his general theory of money and credit at the behest of certain insiders of international finance who hired him to, to concoct a pseudo-scientific justification for government deficit spending, just as a mysterious League of Just Men had hired Karl Marx to write the Communist Manifesto. The farther a government goes into debt, the more interest is paid to the powerful insiders who create money to buy government bonds by the simple expedient of bookkeeping entries. Otherwise, you can bet your last farthing that the insiders of international banking would be violently opposed to inflationary deficits. In his internationally syndicated column on February 3, 1971, James Rustin, CFR, exclaimed, the Nixon budget is so complex, so unlike the Nixon of the past, so unrepublican, that it defies rational analysis. The Nixon budget is more planned, has more welfare, and it has a bigger predic predicated deficit than any other budget of the century. During 1967, while on the primary trail, Richard Nixon made exorbitant Democrat spending his number two campaign issue, just behind the failure of the Democrats to win the Vietnam War. Mr. Johnson's 1967 budget was $158.6 billion, which at the time seemed astronomical. Mr. Nixon claimed that if that amount were not spliced by $10 billion, the country faced financial disaster. At a time when the Vietnam War was a far bigger financial drain than it is now, Richard Nixon argued that we should be spending around $150 billion. President Nixon is now spending $230 billion on bills already introduced in Congress and likely to pass to push the 1972 fiscal budget to $250 billion. The point is that the man who campaigned as Mr. Frugal in 1968 is, in his third year of office, outspending by 80 to $100 billion what he said his predecessor should spend. And some experts are predicting that Mr. Nixon could spend as much as $275 billion next year. This is the same Richard Nixon who, in Dallas on October 11th, 1968 declared that America cannot afford four years of Hubert Humphrey in the White House because he had advocated programs which would have caused a spending spree that would have bankrupted this nation. Candidate Nixon flayed the Johnson administration for failing to cut deficit spending, which is the cause of our present inflation. Budget deficits, he said, lie at the heart of our troubles. For his own part, he renounced any massive step up in federal spending. This is a prescription for further inflation, said Nixon. I believe it is also a prescription for economic disaster. Well, it took LBJ five years to run up a $55 billion deficit, Senator Harry Br Byrd notes that the accumulated deficit for Mr. Nixon's first three years will, will reach at least $88 billion. Congressional experts are now predicting Richard Nixon could well pour on the red ink to a total of $124 billion in this term of office alone. In order to halt inflation, Mr. Nixon has now instituted wage and price controls. Most Americans, sick of seeking, seeing their paychecks shrink and purchasing power each month, have overwhelmingly approved. But this is because most people are not aware of the real cause of inflation. You can be sure that the establishment's landscape painters will not explain the truth to them. The truth is that there is a difference between inflation and the wage price spiral. When the government runs a deficit, brand new money in the amount of the deficit is put into circulation. As the new money percolates through the economy, it bids up wages and prices. This is easy to understand if you think of our economy as a giant auction. Just as at any other auction, if the bidders are suddenly supplied with more money, they will use that money to bid up prices. Inflation in reality is an increase in the supply of money. It causes the wage price spiral, which is generally mislabeled inflation. You could not have a wage pi price spiral if you did not have an increase in the money supply with which to pay it. This is not just economics, it is physics. You can't fill a quart bottle with a pint of milk. To say that the wage price spiral causes inflation is, is like saying wet streets cause rain. Mr. Nixon, unlike the vast majority of the American public, is aware of the real causes of inflation. He explained it clearly on January 27, 1970. 
The inflation we had at the start of the 70s was caused by heavy deficit spending in the 60s. In the past decade, the federal government have spent more than it took in, 57 billion more. These deficits caused prices to rise 25% in a decade. Businesses blamed inflation on the unions, and unions blame inflation on business, but only the government can cause inflation. Mr. Nixon has fastened wage and price controls on the economy, supposedly to solve a problem which Mr. Nixon and LBJ created by running huge deficits. If he sincerely wanted to stop inflation, he would have put wage and price controls on the government rather than on the rest of us and would have stopped deficit spending. People are cheering Nixon because he did something. This is akin to cheering for a motorist who shoots a pedestrian he's just run over. Wage and price controls are at the very heart of socialism. You can't have a totalitarian government without wage and price controls. You can't have a free country with them. Why? You cannot impose slavery upon people who have economic freedom. As long as people have economic freedom, they will be free. Wage and price controls are people controls. In his phase two speech, Mr. Nixon made it clear that the 90-day wage and price controls are with us in one disguise or another from, no from now on. They are a major step towards establishing an all-powerful executive branch of the federal government. After the insiders have established the United Socialist States of America, in fact, if not in name, the next step is the great merger of all nations of the world into a dictatorial world government. This was the main reason behind the push to bring Red China into the United Nations. If you want to control the natural resources, transportation, commerce, and banking for the whole world, you must put everybody under the same roof. The insider's code word for the world super state is New World Order, a phrase often used by Richard Nixon. The Council on Foreign Relations states in its study number seven, the U.S. must strive to a. build a new international order. Establishment spokesman James Rustin, CFR, declared in his internationally syndicated column for the New York Times of May 21st, 1971, Nixon would obviously like to preside over the creation of a new world order, and he believes he has an opportunity to do so in the last 20 months of his first term. The world government has always been the, been the object of the communists. In 1915, in, in number 40 of the r Russian organ, the socialist Democrat Lenin proposed a United States of the World. The program of the Communist International of 1936 says that world dictatorship can be established only by victory of socialism in different countries or groups of countries, after which the proletariat republics would unite on federal lines with those already in existence, and this system would expand at length, forming the World Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. One of the most important groups promoting the World Union is the United World Federalists, whose membership is heavily interlocked with that of the Council on Foreign Relations. The UWF advocate turning the UN into a full-fledged world government, which would include the communist nations. Richard Nixon is, is, of course, far too clever to actually join the UWF, but he has supported their legislative program since his early days in Congress. In the October 1948 issue of the UWF publication, World Government News, on page 14, there appears the following announcement. Richard Nixon introduced World Government Resolution, HCR 68, 1947, and ABC, World Government Resolution, 1948. World Government has a strong emotional appeal for Americans based on their universal desire for world peace. The insiders had the communists rattling their sabers with one hand and dangling the olive branch with the other. Naturally, everyone gravitates toward the olive branch, not realizing that the olive branch is controlled by another arm of the entity that is rattling the sabers. In September of 1968, candidates for public office received a letter from the United World Federalists that stated, Our organization has been endorsed and commended by all U.S. presidents in the last 20 years and by the current nominees for the presidency. These examples we quote as follows. Richard Nixon. Your organization can pre perform an important service by continuing to emphasize that world peace can only come through world law. Our goal is world peace. Our instrument for achieving peace will be the law and justice. If we concentrate our energies toward these ends, I am hopeful that real progress can be made. Hubert Humphrey, every one of us is committed to brotherhood among all nations, but no one pursues these goals with more dignity and dedication than the United World Federalists. There really was not a dime's worth of difference. Voters were given the choice between CFR World Government Advocate Nixon and CFR World Government Advocate Humphrey. Only the rhetoric was changed to fool the public. 
A world government requires a world supreme court, and Mr. Nixon is on record in favor of a world supreme court. And a world government must have a world police force to enforce the laws of the world superstate and keep the slaves from rebelling. The Los Angeles Examiner of October 28, 1950 reported that Congressman Richard Nixon had introduced a resolution calling for the establishment of a United Nations police force. Not surprisingly, the insiders have their pet planners preparing to administer their world dictatorship. Under an immense geodetic dome at Southern Illinois University, it is a completely detailed map of the world which occupies the space of three football fields. Operating under grants from the Ford, Carnegie, and Rockefeller Foundations, all extensively interlocked with the CFR, a battery of scientists including everything from geographers, psychologists, and behavioral scientists, to natural scientists, biologists, biochemists, and agronomists make, are making plans to control people. These elite planners conduct exercises in what they call the world game. For example, there are too many people in country A and not enough people in country B. How do you move people from country A to country B? We need so many males, so many females, so many of this occupation and so many of that occupation, so many of this age and so many of that age. How do you get these people from country A and settle them in country B in the shortest possible time? Another example, we have an uprising in country C, or as it now call, now be called District C. How long does it take to send in peace forces to stop the insurgency? The world game people run exercises on global control. If you plan on running the world, you cannot go about it haphazardly. That is why the insiders of the Ford, Carnegie, and Rockefeller Foundations are making these plans. The real name of the game is 1984. We will have systematic population reduction, forced sterilization, or anything else which the planners deem necessary to establish absolute control in their humanitarian utopia. But to enforce these plans, you must have an all-powerful world government, and you can't do this if an individual nation has sovereignty. Before you destroy the local police, remove the, the guns from the hands of the citizenry. And before you can facilitate the great merger, you must first centralize control within each nation, destroy the local police, and remove the guns from the hands of the citizenry. You must replace our once free constitutional republic with an all-powerful central government. And that is exactly what is happening today with the Nixon administration. Every action of any consequence, despite the smokescreen, has centralized more power in what is rapidly becoming an all-powerful central government. What we are witnessing is the communist tactic of pressure from above and pressure from below, described by communist historian Jan Kozak as the device used by the Reds to capture control of Czechoslovakia. The pressure from above comes from secret, ostensible, re respectable comrades in the government and establishment. Forming with the radicalized mobs in the streets below, a giant pincer around middle-class society. The street rioters are pawns, shills, puppets, and dupes for an oligarchy of elitist conspirators working above to turn America's limited government into an unlimited government with total control over our lives and property. The American middle class is being squeezed to death by a vice. In the streets we have avowed revolutionary groups such as the Students for a Democratic Society, which was started by the League for Industrial Democracy, a group with strong CFR ties, the Black Panthers, the Yippies, the Young Socialist Alliance. These groups chant that if we don't change, America will lose it. Change is the word we hear over and over. By change, these groups mean socialism. Virtually all members of these groups sincerely believe that they are fighting the establishment. In reality, they are an indispensable ally of the establishment in fastening socialism on all of us. The naive radicals think that under socialism, the people will run everything. Actually, it will be a clique of insiders in total control, consolidating and controlling all wealth. That is why these schoolboy Lenins and teenage Trotskys are allowed to roam free. They're practically never arrested or prosecuted. They're protected. If the establishment wanted the revolutionary stop, how long do you think they would be tolerated? Instead, we find most of these radicals are the recipients of large essay from major f foundations or are receiving money from the government through the war on poverty. The Rothschild, Rockefeller, CFR insiders at the top surrender the demands for socialism from the mobs below. The radicals are doing the work of those whom they hate the most. Remember Bakunin's charge that Marx's followers had one foot in the bank and the other in the socialist movement. Further indications of the establishment financing of the communist SDS are contained in James Coonan's The Strawberry Statement, Notes of the College Revolutionary. 
describing events uh, at the 1968 ADS National Convention, Kudin says, Also at the convention, men from Business International Roundtables, the meetings sponsored by Business International, their client groups and heads of government, tried to buy up a few radicals. These men are the world's leading industrialists, and they convene to decide how our lives are going to go. These are the boys who wrote the Alliance for Progress. They're the left wing of the ruling class. They agreed with us on black control and student control. They would want McCarthy in. They see fascism as a threat, see it coming from Wallace. The only way McCarthy could win is if the crazies and young radicals act up and make Gene look more reasonable. They offered to finance our demonstrations in Chicago. We were also offered ESO, Rockefeller, money. They want us to make a lot of radical commotion so they can look more in the center as they move to the left. That is the strategy. The landscape painters focus your attention on the kids in the street while the real danger is from above. As Frank Capel recently observed in the review of the news, of course we know that these radical students are not going to take over the government. What they are going to do is provide the excuse for the government to take over the people by passing more and more repressive laws to keep things under control. The radicals make a commotion in the streets while the limousine liberals at the top in New York and Washington are socializing us. We are going to have a dictatorship of the elite disguised as a dictatorship of the proletariat. Now the insiders of the establishment are moving into a more sophisticated method of applying pressure from below. John Gardner, a Republican and member of the CFR, has established a grassroots proletarian organization called Common Cause. This may become the biggest and most important organization in American history. Common Cause's goal is to organize welfare recipients, those who have not voted before, and liberals to lobby for socialism. That lobbying will not only be expressed in pressuring Congress to pass socialist legislation, but will also be expressed as ballot power in elections. Common Cause is supposedly the epitome of anti-establishmentarianism. But who is paying the bills? The elite insider radicals from above. The number one bankroller of this group to overthrow the super-rich and redistribute their wealth among the poor is John D. Rockefeller III. Other key financiers are Andrew Heskell, CFR, Chairman of the Board of Time, Inc., Thomas Watson, CFR, Chairman of the Board of IBM, John Whitney, CFR, of the Standard Oil Fortune, Sol Linowitz, CFR, Chairman of the Board of Xerox, and Gardner Cowles, CFR of Cowles Publications. In any organization, the man who pays the bills is the boss. The others are, are his employees. What better proof could we have that socialism is not a movement of downtrodden masses, but of power-hungry elites? The poor are merely pawns in the game. Needless to say, the landscape painters hide common causes, financial an angels, so that only those who understand that the establishment's game plan of socialism understand what is going on before their very eyes.